we live on a water world. Two thirds of the planet are covered by water with an average depth of four kilometers. If you collected all of that water together, it would form a sphere about the size of North America. The fact that the ocean basins are lower than the land means that all the water collects there instead of spilling out and flooding the continents. But have you ever stopped to wonder exactly why the ocean basins are all so much lower than the continents and the land that we live on? Well, today I'm gonna to explain exactly why that is by giving you a virtual microscope tour of this rock. Hi, I'm Brooke and I'm a geologist. Welcome to the channel where I show you the secrets of geology and how to read the story that's written in the rocks. If you haven't already, I would love it if you hit the subscribe button and give the video a big thumbs up if you like it. There's going to be a mountain of neat geoscience content coming at you over the next few months and I wouldn't want you to miss out on it. Okay, let's get cracking. <laughs> so the rock we're looking at this week is a crystalline rock and it's got very large crystals. Some of them are over a centimeter long. So we're not gonna to need to stick it under the binocular microscope to see the crystals close up. What we are gonna do though, is have a look at it close up under the camera, and then we'll jump straight on the petrographic microscope and look at it in thin section. So the first things we might notice about this rock is that it looks like there's only two kinds of crystal grain here. We've got these white milky ones, and then we've got these dark blocky shiny ones. So I have a think back to our last microscope session. You might remember that we saw some milky white crystal grains there, and those are the feldspars. So straight away, we can hypothesize that we might actually have a rock that's very rich in feldspars. We did see some black shiny crystals, but they were clay flakes, and they were platy and flaky, whereas these dark crystals are blocky. The clay flakes were also quite soft, whereas these are really hard. I can't scratch them with my nails. And I have a feeling I wouldn't be able to scratch them if I had a steel point either. Some of them are kind of a dark black brown, but some of them are rounder and have a green tinge to them. So maybe there's three different crystals here. Notice as well that we've got this texture that we would call hollow crystalline. The rock is completely crystalline and all the crystals are interlocking nice and neatly with each other. So all of these different bits of information that we've just observed will help us identify what this rock is. The fact that these crystals are big enough to see with the naked eye is important because it means that the rock cooled quite slowly. It also tells us that even though the rock was found on the Earth's surface, it must have formed deep underground. This starts to tell us a lot about the mechanisms and processes that led to the formation of the rock. And in turn, that tells us about mechanisms and processes deep within the Earth that we can't directly observe. So let's try and ID these minerals now. So in PPL, see we've got this low relief mineral that was probably our milky white tabular mineral doesn't show any pleochroism when we rotate the stage if we jump into xpl we can see all of these nice crystal twins and that distinctive first order coloring so we've seen this mineral before it's our friend plagioclase feldspar so this is what plagioclase feldspar crystals look like when they grow normally the ones we saw in the sandstone had been weathered quite a lot and so they were nice and round but here we can see that they've got this nice long tabular shape so next up we had those dark minerals and there's possibly two different kinds so let's have a look at the browny black minerals that's probably these grains here so we can see that they've got this anhedral shape and that means that they don't have a nice square shape or a nice crystalline shape like the feldspars it means that they're sort of blobby. We can see they've got these little lines on them, it looks like a cross hatching, and that's called cleavage. And that's the planes along which the crystals are growing. So we know that this isn't feldspar, and we know it's not quartz, which are minerals that we've seen before. This is something new. So if we rotate the stage, there might be a bit of weak pleochroism there, it might be going pinkish. Let's hop up into XPL and see what we can see. Oh wow, oh how cool is that? <laughs> Look at all those high birefringence colours, all those high interference colours. The optical properties we've observed, you can see here it goes into extinction, 
at an angle called inclined extinction. Bright third order birefringence colours, well developed cleavage. So that means this mineral is a clinopyroxene. Okay, it turns out that those that the green, greenish dark mineral is actually different from the pyroxene. So let's have a look at those ones now. Here's one here. You can see it's anhedral again, which means it doesn't have a nice crystal shape, it's just kind of like a bob. It does have a bit of a green tinge to it, but no pleochroism. It doesn't have any cleavage, it's covered in fractures. It's got a much higher relief than the surrounding pyroxenes and feldspars. Let's jump into XPL. Whoa, look at those colours. This mineral is olivine. And olivine you may be more familiar with as the gemstone peridot. It's a beautiful green mineral. Fantastic. So we've got three minerals there. Plagioclase feldspar, clinopyroxene, and olivine. We've got quite a lot of evidence now, so let's have a recap put it all together and then give a name to this rock. We've got three primary minerals. We've got plagioclase feldspar, clinopyroxene, and olivine. Plagioclase, pyroxene, and olivine are igneous minerals, and that means that they crystallize from a melt of molten rock. The primary minerals are neatly interlocking as well as being large, and that means that they had plenty of time to grow in the magma they all grew at the same time. They wouldn't have crystallized instantaneously out of the magma at the same time, but close enough. Igneous rocks that form at or near the Earth's surface, such as the stuff that gets erupted out of volcanoes, cool very quickly and have very fine grained crystals. They're called extrusive rocks, or shallow intrusive, if you want to be technical. Igneous rocks that form deep down within the Earth's crust cool slowly, have large crystals and are called intrusive rocks because they intrude other rocks that are already there. Our rock has large crystals, it must have cooled slowly, therefore we know it's an intrusive igneous rock. The minerals that we've identified, the olivine, plagioclase and pyroxene, but especially the olivine and pyroxene, contain a lot of iron and magnesium. And rocks that are formed from minerals that contain lots of iron and magnesium are called mafic rocks. Mafic is just an abbreviation for magnesium and iron rich or something, I don't know. Igneous petrology, igneous petrologists. Melts of this type form deep down in the Earth's crust when the mantle undergoes partial melting. If you don't know, the mantle is the bit that sits underneath the Earth's crust. We'll do an episode about the structure of the Earth. It'll be fine, don't worry about it for now. This is the sort of thing that we need a fast diagram for. The mantle is actually mostly solid and it's already pretty hot, but there are certain situations that can cause melting. The most common way to melt the mantle is to rapidly reduce the pressure, and that's something that's happening right now all over the world at oceanic ridges. As the mantle melts, the hot magma rises and wells up between cracks in the ocean plate, pushing the plate apart and stretching it, reducing the pressure and causing more melting. This causes the plate to spread and the ocean to widen, is a really important part of the plate tectonic cycle. So what does this have to do with our original question? Why do the oceans sit lower than the continents of land and form these basins that can fill up with water? Well, ocean crust is made of this. Gabbro and its fine-grained equivalent, basalt. As magma wells up underneath the ridge, some of it cools at depth and becomes gabbro, like the one we've been looking at. Some of it gets closer to the surface and becomes fine-grained basalt. And some of it actually erupts out onto the seabed as incredible pillow lavas, and it cools so rapidly that crystals can't form and it becomes glass. We know this process has been going on for a really long time because we actually find ancient pillow basalts still with their nice round pillowy shape, sometimes even at the tops of mountains. Well, this is cool, but what does it have to do with our original question about why the oceans sit lower? Well, it all comes down to density. If you haven't heard that word before, density just means how much stuff is in a given volume, three-dimensional space. Ocean crust is made of gabbro and basalt, full of iron and magnesium, whereas continental crust is made of silica-rich rocks, like the sandstone we looked at last time, and granites, which we'll look at in the future, and that were probably eroded to create that sandstone. Silica is much less dense than the magnesium and iron-rich minerals. 
that make up the mafic rocks. If you've ever held a chunk of iron, you'll know how heavy it feels compared to, say, a piece of glass. So that means that ocean crust is much more dense than continental crust. And that's why ocean crust sits lower in the mantle than continental crust. It's why you can build continental crust up into huge 70 kilometer thicknesses, like in the Himalayan mountains, but ocean crust still sits lower, even though it's only 11 to seven kilometers thick. Imagine it like corks bobbing up and down on some water, and one of the corks has a, a little rock sat on it, so it sinks a little bit lower. It's just that little bit more dense, and that density contrast between the mantle, the ocean crust, and the continental crust that allows ocean basins to form and fill up with water and us to have separate differentiated continental land masses and plate tectonics. But if ocean crust is less dense than the mantle, how can subduction happen? It's actually a pretty fascinating process, but uh, that's for another video. So that's why we have ocean basins, because of the density difference between mafic rich oceanic crust and then felsic rich continental crust. Without that density difference, there probably wouldn't be ocean basins or much dry land for that matter. In fact, it's thought that billions of years ago, the entire Earth's surface was covered in a global ocean because modern plate tectonics hadn't started and there was no differentiation between continental and ocean crust. Thanks very much for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed learning about crustal density and contrast. It certainly blew my mind when I first learned about this stuff. So some questions for you to answer in the comments below, just to have a think about. Where else on Earth do you think you might find mafic rocks? Do you think they could ever be found on the continents, and not just in the ocean basins? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and let me know any other questions you might have about rocks, mafic or otherwise. If you have any requests for particular rocks, I'm not going to talk about subaqueous dolerites, okay? If you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel, give the video a big thumbs up, and then shared it with your friends on social media as well. So until next time, take care, see you later. Bye bye.